So welcome to the show. My name is Mohamed Kalashi. I'm an AWS community builder and software engineer at Zero and One. Today, I'm fortunate to be with Luciano. Uh, would, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you very much for having me. First of all, it's a pleasure to be part of this show. So my name is Luciano. I am uh, an Italian software engineer, even though I live in Ireland, in Dublin. And I am uh, pretty much, I will describe myself like a mixture between a full stack developer and a cloud architect. Maybe we'll get to talk more about that. And I'm currently working with a company called Fortirem in, in Dublin, Ireland. So you're working as a senior architect at Fortirem. Would you like mm -hmm. to talk about what they do and what your role constitutes? constitutes of? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we like to define the company, uh, a boutique consultancy company uh, and boutique because it's still relatively small. I think we are around 15 developers at this stage. It is growing organically. So maybe next year we, we'll, we'll start to change the, the, the way we describe the company, but we, we really like to, to keep it small for now because we, we like to establish a very strong connection with our customers. And as a company, we are focused mostly on cloud computing, serverless, and AWS. We have been helping our customers to either migrate to AWS, or if they are already in AWS, we help them to improve their deployments and try to get the best out of the cloud. It's interesting as a company because we have a team of generalists. So most people in the tech team, they have quite broad range of experience. And my role as well tends to be very broad. I... Even though my title is architect, I don't get to work with customers only in kind of an architect fashion where we discuss the architecture, we review what is the architecture for a certain project, and we try to make decisions in terms of scalability, costs, and so on. I'm also involved most of the time also in building the project itself. So I end up pairing with the team of our customers and actually writing code and helping them to actually build the, the project which is something I really enjoy because having a background as a software engineer and full stack developer, I still like to, to get that feeling that I'm not just thinking about like whiteboards and diagrams and building blocks, but actually getting my hands dirty and actually do the work and build things. And I think it's um, very interesting to see that most of the time you think about an architecture and in theory, everything is nice and works perfectly. When you actually start to build it, you realize that there are so many trade-offs that you have to make and you haven't thought about them before. So I think having that perspective also as a developer helps a lot then to refine the architecture as well. Yeah, I understand you on this point. We even face it at work as well, where we, uh, at the company that I, work, I currently work in, we, they teach you to become a solution architect to understand how mm -hmm. things work on the cloud, but even though they hire us as software developers. Because they know that there's a certain level where you come into a certain pitfall or something that you need to do in the code wise. On the architecture wise, mm -hmm. you might think it's perfect. It's going to work as intended, but as you're doing the software, you might change the architect that you're currently in to fit the software that you're currently working in. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's critical because otherwise it's like, yeah, when you study something in theory and then the practice is very different and then somebody has to figure out the gap and yeah, maybe there you have problems or inconsistencies and so on. But she offers clients help on services on AWS solely or other clouds as well. We have been doing a few smaller projects on other clouds. I think we did uh, something around Azure. I don't think we ever did Google Cloud yet, as far as I'm aware, but I think AWS is definitely our main focus. We are also AWS partners, so we also have very good relationship with AWS itself. So I think it's just easier for us to get work that is related to AWS. So it's choosing, you chose AWS as the cloud provider of choice towards doing all of your services with your clients. Yeah, I think has been more the fact that I think the founders and the few first few hires of the company already had a very good experience with AWS. So I think it was kind of a organic choice that kind of happened that most of our projects were gravitating around AWS. Then we became partners with AWS. So I think that relationship grow more and more. And I think it's easier for us to keep working with AWS rather than trying to become experts in every single cloud provider. 
So I'm going to shift towards another question, which is that you've transitioned mm -hmm. between multiple companies where you shifted from being a software developer towards a cloud architect. What made you shift towards this path? And do you think focusing on the cloud is the next step for every single software developer as it, it's a step that they should move forward with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what made me shift? I actually don't know 100%. I think it was kind of a... Uh, things happen and organically I realize, okay, I'm doing more and more cloud related stuff. And eventually I decided to try to specialize even more by getting the certifications because my, most of my career has been web development and good mixture between front end and back end databases. So that's why I, I like to describe myself mostly as a full stack web developer. But in the last, I think five or six years, I've been involved more and more in projects that had a significant cloud component. And I was actually in the teams that were building some of that stuff as well, not just the application side. So I kind of got myself pushed into, okay, let's think about the cloud, not just how do we build this application, but how do we ship it to the cloud? How do we make it scalable? How do we make it observable? How do we make it testable for the cloud? So kind of organically, I got more and more experience and I, I was fascinated by all these topics that I didn't have to think about them before in my just full stack developer role. So my role became more and more the kind of hybrid between development and cloud, which I think is really interesting, but I would not necessarily say that every developer needs to go down that path. I think there is still a lot of space for being specialized and focusing only on one thing. I think there is always a choice in kind of the developer career. Do you want to be extremely specialized in one thing and be like the worldwide expert. And there's definitely value in that. Or do you want to be good enough at many things and be able to kind of shift and try different things and help in different places? I think I tend to be more on the generalist side, even though I have few specialities like JavaScript and Node.js. But yeah, again, it's, it's a choice that I think everyone needs to make. And also regarding cloud, it's a very big topic. It's a very big trend. It seems that everything is moving to the cloud. I would agree with that kind of mindset, but at the same time, I don't think that there isn't space for other stuff. So I don't think that everyone needs to just jump in the cloud because that's the future. It might be true for most projects, but at the same time, if you don't think you want to focus on the cloud, I think there is still space to try different things and to go with more traditional architectures. So uh, I'm going to give the reason why I asked this mm -hmm. is because there are certain companies that they have, let's say the team leader is the one who has access to the accounts on the cloud. Mm -hmm. And usually the juniors are just the ones who write code and the senior would just review them. So they mm -hmm. don't all the time have to be involved in the whole cycle. While some companies would resolve to tell the developers, okay, this is the, let's say, code pipeline, this is the code build, this is the CDK that does this. They start mm -hmm. teaching them, let's say, moving from one environment to another. So not every single company do offer this luxury of learning about the cloud. So some of them do teach the developers that they currently have junior or senior or whatever level you are, even if you have a specific specialty. Mm -hmm. They do teach him about the cloud so that in case they wanted to use that developer for another project, he can be able to provide help rather than just keeping him narrowed down to software development. Yeah, I think that's definitely true that different companies will have different ways of organizing the work. I do prefer the kind of company that gives you a little bit more visibility about the cloud, just because I think that if you understand how the application is going to run in production or in all sorts of different environments, I think there are more chances that as a developer, you can optimize for those environments. But at the same time, I've seen companies being very successful with a very simple contract, like you just need to give me a container. So write the code, make sure it builds as a container. And then how we run this container, there is like, I don't know, a platform team or an infrastructure team that deals with all of that and the developer doesn't have to worry. So I don't know, I think, yeah, that both things can work. But I suppose if you are curious about the cloud, it can be, as you said, a luxury to work in one of those companies that will give you more and more visibility because they want you to be a little bit more generalist and more flexible with your role. So from 2013 to 2015, you were the CTO for a company called Spam. Mm -hmm. Spam. 
Spam, which is S E A A M, an online fashion marketplace that got chosen by the Bank of Ireland Accelerator in 2015. And it was the only startup with a foreign team. What mm -hmm. challenges you faced as a CTO and why did you resolve towards shutting down the startup? You do state on the website you were an entrepreneur, hence I'm expecting that you left the side hustle to focus on the craft rather than taking care of businesses, right? Lots of questions. Okay, let me try <laughs> to answer them in order. So what challenges did I face as a CTO? Well, first of all, it was a very small startup. It was like three people, two software engineers, and one person that was responsible for like all the fashion relationship and selecting the fashion products and so on. Uh, so that, that's a challenge on its own. Like I think it was also one of my very first like complex projects, I would say in my career. So that was also a challenge on its own. It was a little bit overwhelming to try to figure out, okay, in principle, we have this vision. We want to build a marketplace that can connect uh, independent fashion designers with fashion conscious people. And we saw clearly that the market was looking for something like that. So the vision was there, but then, okay, how do we? make it happen. And technically there are so many challenges. I, I would say that that was probably the time where I started to be more and more interested about all the infrastructure side of software engineering or web development, if you want, because until then I was only building web applications and not really worrying too much about, okay, how do we put them in production in a scalable way? How do we make sure that we have a pipeline? How do we write tests and make sure that when we ship something to the cloud, we can test it do like integration tests and make sure everything works so our customers are not impacted by a breaking change or a bug or something like that. So all these were challenges that even though they were overwhelming, I, I'm really happy I did this kind of experience because being only two engineers, like we really had to figure it out between ourselves. And I think the amount of learning, I never learned so much in such a short amount of time. So it, it was kind of a career changing experience. In terms of why did we decide to shut down the startup? As a startup, we were very young and it was our first experience. I think we did all the usual mistakes that you can do in a startup, like over engineering, spending too much time building so many features that nobody is ever gonna use without actually making sure, like do our customers really need these features? Then also, we didn't really have a lot of budget because we were essentially bootstrapping the startup and it was our experience after university, our first experience after university. So we didn't really have a lot of savings. So basically, we tried to do everything with as zero budget as possible, which meant working overnight, weekends, try to effectively, we couldn't really offload anything. We, we brought more and more work into ourselves. And I think there was a little bit of burnout as well in all of that. So I think eventually, even though at some point we were making a little bit of revenue, we proved that the model was working. We started to get brands that were interested in the platform and people coming in to buy the products. I think at that point we were so exhausted and so burned out. And at the same time, we were not able to finalize another round of investment to try to hire more people and scale more. So I think eventually we just decided that was not sustainable anymore and we shut down the, the company at that point. And you are right in saying that since then, even though I still have the kind of entrepreneurial mindset, I always think, oh, this project will be cool. I will build it this way. I will launch it this way. I will try to grow it this way. I will try to get funding this way or maybe bootstrap it. But at the same time, I'm ending up focusing more and more on just being a software engineer, being an architect. And I don't know why is that. I think I have an internal struggle within myself, but I'm, so far I'm finding more enjoyable the safety of having a permanent role with a company and learning at the same time and feeling that I'm growing rather than just going into another startup where you have a lot more uncertainties and risk. Yeah, I feel you on this. Some people just want to have a safe job and just settle down. Maybe you can focus on things that do matter to you. So let's say mm -hmm. you focus more on doing uh, Node.js work or you can focus on writing content that do matter to you. Well, some yeah. people do have the adrenaline and rush of entering in a startup and putting themselves into risk. There's no, depends on the type of person you are, but, Absolutely, yeah. but sticking with, let's say a company and focusing on the craft, you also co-authored the Node.js design patterns mm -hmm. and it's published by packet. 
yeah. what made you head towards writing a book in the first place and what challenges you faced when writing a book? Yeah, that's a very interesting story and I'm going to try to summarize it because it might take too actually, long to... Actually, if you want, you can take, take your time. I have no problem. Okay. So I'm, but I'm going to try not to bore everyone in the audience. Basically, uh, I, when I started as a web developer, I think I was mostly doing PHP because that, that, that's what was cool at the time. And, uh, and nothing wrong with, with PHP anyway, just, just for the records. But because I, I was doing PHP and then I started to do a lot more and more front end. And in the front end, I was doing a lot of jQuery. And then I think React wasn't even out there. There were other things like Knockout JS. And I was playing with all these frameworks and having a lot of fun. I actually really enjoyed JavaScript. Then I eventually I realized, oh, there is this new shiny thing called Node.js. And now I can finally write JavaScript also in the backend. So I started to be very, very excited about uh, Node.js. Uh, but at the same time, I realized that there was a little bit of a shift between like, how do you write software in PHP, which was becoming more and more like Java, like that enterprise stuff where you use all the solid patterns and where you write classes and yeah, that, that kind of way of developing. While when you go to Node.js, it's a lot more freeform, a lot more minimalist. People tend to be a lot more functional. So the way I, that I started to try to get more confidence with Node.js was I built a very simple software, which I think was like a CLI to download galleries of pictures from Flickr, because at that time it was not possible to do that. Like you had to download pictures one by one. And one day I wanted to download a gallery that had like hundreds of pictures. So I was like, oh, I'm learning Node.js. This seems like the perfect project to practice and build something that actually is useful in a way. So I built all of that and it was actually non-trivial. I remember a lot of pain in trying to figure out, oh, there is a lot of asynchronous stuff that I need to coordinate, the usual callback L. At the time, there weren't even promises or if there were, it was like Bluebeard, it was like native promises. So I was not really confident at all about my implementation. Even though it was working, I was using it and it was doing its job. I was like, okay, I really want somebody that has more experience than me to Look at this code and tell me what I'm doing wrong. And I found out an Italian community on Facebook of Node.js developers. And I just said, look, this is my, my thing. I'm not an expert at all. I'm just learning. Feel free to literally destroy me with comments. <laughs> and then actually people were, were very good in, in the sense that they were not really uh, taking the piece. They were actually giving me very useful suggestions on what I could improve. And I really learned a lot. And one of the people that gave me a lot of suggestion was Mario Casciaro, who was the first author of Node.js Design Patterns, because uh, this was actually the book that I read when I started to learn Node.js, and he was the first author. He was the only author for the first edition. So I was extremely flattered that I had the, the opportunity to kind of talk to him, and I got a lot of suggestion from him. And then I realized that he was living in Dublin, and I was thinking to move to Dublin myself as well. So we kind of got in touch and started to chat also on a more kind of personal basis. And eventually when I moved to Dublin, we met, we went for a beer, we had a few chats. And a few months afterwards, he, he contacted me to say, oh, I see that you have your own blog. You're writing a lot of stuff about Node.js. And I, I want to do a new edition of the book because so many things have changed until the, since the first edition. That was the time where there was the whole uh, breakdown that there was the IOJS fork and people were like, oh, what's going to happen to Node.js? Then eventually uh, IOJS and Node.js joined together and they released Node 4. And with Node 4, there were so many changes, like even promises and so on. So it was a big shift and it was a good time to write a new edition of the book that incorporated all the changes. But Mario was like, I don't really have a lot of time. I would like to find somebody that can help me. And I was flattered and scared at that point in that because I still was not confident at all about my Node.js skills. But at the same time, I realized, okay, I'm not going to be alone doing this thing. I actually going to work with Mario, who has a massive experience, has been using Node.js for years. He has been writing one of the books that I enjoyed the most about Node.js. So actually, I felt that was a huge opportunity, even though it was like a jump outside my comfort zone. So eventually I decided to say yes, and I don't regret the decision because one thing is that you, 
you think you, you know something. And the other thing is when you realize, okay, now I have to explain something to somebody else. And you start to ask yourself so many questions and you realize, actually, I didn't know the thing. Let me go and check out all the things I don't know. Let me verify that my knowledge is actually correct. And I think that whole process was what made my Node.js understanding much, much better. And that took about one year to, to write the, the second edition while I still had a full-time job at the time. But yeah, that, that was kind of a life-changing experience because I think I learned so much. I was able to out, co-author a book and work together with somebody that had so much experience. So yeah, definitely uh, an interesting story. I think I was lucky in the end just to to find, uh, to meet the right people at the right time and find the right opportunity. But at the same time, I think there is a little bit of a lesson there for, for people that sometimes if you have an opportunity, even if you don't feel 100% confident, take that opportunity and you probably, yeah, it might be a little bit harsh that you would need to learn on the spot, but at the same time can be looking back can be a valuable opportunity for you to, to grow a lot more than you would normally. That's about, you didn't expect that things are going to happen this way. Absolutely not. Yeah. And so you just, the, the idea behind it is you push the software that you wanted to push on the group. You told them, Hey, review this. Uh, any kind of feedback is highly appreciated on all of that. And it led you towards co-authoring the book, which is a very mm -hmm. amazing story, actually. But it's about just people don't have to fear about doing things that they do love because Absolutely. of the criticism of people. Absolutely. And I think sometimes even if I think I got some criticism, but I think you need to be humble and you need to be able to distinguish like bad negative feedback from actually constructive feedback and try to eliminate all the negativeness and just take whatever is useful to you and yeah use that for to your own advantage as an excuse to grow rather than just i don't know being disappointed with yourself and maybe giving up because you felt like you're not good enough i think that there is also a lesson there because the internet can be a very negative place so you need to be able to kind of skim down and remove all the negativeness and keep only what's what's useful to you, what's giving you value, what's giving you good, good inputs, basically. But when writing a book, there are certain qualifications that a publisher expects you to, to have, to trust that you're mm -hmm. working with a knowledgeable person. Now, in your case, you were working with Mario, so you have someone who's, who, who have written a book before, so it gives you some mm -hmm. street creds. But is, do you have any idea what the qualifications you have to earn to, to have a trust from a publisher? Let's say, for example, like years of experience is no longer a metric because some people can, can be working, let's say, one to two years in open source and they can write better code than people who've been like 10 years in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my case was a little bit outside the norm. But I think, of course, I got an introduction from Mario, and I think that was already enough for the publisher that I was probably good enough. But at the same time, I think what convinced Mario that I was I was going to be good enough to help him with the new edition was the fact that I was uh, publishing blog posts, uh, not necessarily regularly, but I think uh, I was putting a lot of effort into those blog posts. And probably Mario saw that I could write code and explain what that code does and create a little bit of story around it. And I think that's probably for this kind of books, I think that's probably a good starting point. Then of course, when you write a book, you are not alone, but especially if you have a publisher, you're going to get editors, you're going to get reviewers. So all of that stuff helps you to be a little bit more confident that eventually you put out there something that has a decent quality. So, uh, speaking of writing blog posts and get, writing a book and all of that, uh, this catch the attention of Microsoft as saying that you're a Microsoft most valuable personnel or MVP, which is an mm -hmm. award given to the individuals who contribute in different mediums, like writing uh, blogs and podcasts and much more. And that's something that someone at Microsoft should nominate you for it, as mm -hmm. I would recall. It's similar, something similar to, let's say, Google with their developer expert, the GDE, or Amazon with their hero program. So you're mm -hmm. a specific hero on a specific topic. Uh, would you like to talk more about this and the steps that you've taken towards achieving this award? Now, I know that writing blog posts is going to be the first step for you, but you'd like to expand more on this? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the, the way the MVP works is that you have to be nominated by another MVP, not necessarily somebody at Microsoft. So I think that makes it a little bit easier that in your network, you might bump into somebody who is already an MVP. And if they like what you're doing, they might be able to nominate you. And, and this was my case. Uh, somebody that now I know very well was actually, I was engaging with them and they saw all the material I put out, out there in terms of blog posts and open source and the book itself. And they were like, oh, I think you might be an MVP. And they just put the nomination out there. What happens after that is that Microsoft reached out, reached out to you and basically you have to fill a form. It's actually a very long and boring form where you really have to list every single activity that you have done during the last year in terms of, let's say, content creation in the most generic term. And then for every one of those, you need to pick the right category, the right area, and then you need to add the description. And there are even things like let's say metrics where you have to kind of assess the impact that your content had, like, I don't know, the number of people that potentially have seen your content and read it or consume it in some other way. So there is a lot of, yeah, like yeah, you just try to describe everything you did, but it's not easy and it takes a lot of time. And then after that, Microsoft will review all this material and they will decide if they are going to give you the award or not. And what's even more interesting is that you need to keep doing that every year because every year they will decide whether they will renew the title or not. I'm actually waiting to see if my title is going to be renewed. I think it's going to happen in the next couple of weeks or not. So it's just a, a name or do they give you like certain qualifications for it? So you generally are nominated in a particular area. In my case is developer technologies, which I think is a little bit broad, but there are other areas like, I don't know, Microsoft product experts, like, I don't know, Azure, for instance, will be one of those. So I think my one is probably the most generic one because in reality, I don't really use a lot of Microsoft tools for, for different reasons. Um, um, yeah, uh, after you get the title, you are a little bit more involved with the group of the other MVPs. Like there are uh, certain conferences or even certain calls that Microsoft organized to try to connect more and more people in the program. And also you get some uh, benefits, let's say, basically you have discounts for certain tools or access to certain Microsoft products for free. So you also get access to a series of uh, advantages just because you are part of this network. But if, let's say, for example, you, they didn't nominate you, let's say the next year. So let's say if mm -hmm. you take it in like 2019 and they didn't mm -hmm. renew your progress in 2020, do they strip the name or you still, they, you stay in the network? That's a good question. I think you lose all the benefits for sure. There is a website with a list of all the MVPs. I think your name will still be there. And probably there is only a list of the years that you have been an MVP. So probably it's going to be something like not an MVP anymore, but used to be an MVP in 2019. And I also saw that there is another program that is like, if you have been an MVP before, but you lost the title because maybe for one year you didn't do enough contributions, they have like a reinsertion program. I'm not really sure what that means, but I think you, if you have been an MVP already, it's probably going to be easier to get the title again. Probably you just need to meet certain requirements. Yeah, I didn't actually expect to know you have to redo it every single year. I thought it's like you take yeah. the title once and then let's say next year you reapply, you might get the title again. I have a friend of mine, actually, he's an MVP. He has this uh, a glass and he stacked mm -hmm. uh, 20, 2018 and 2019. They give you like, yeah. you stack them on top of each other. I thought it's like it's a yearly thing that you apply for and they nominate you back. But I didn't expect that if... If you didn't apply for the next year, you get certain things removed. I didn't expect yeah, that. I think you apply automatically just by being an MVP the previous year, but you still need to fill all the form again with all the new contributions since the previous year. So I think Microsoft is always making sure that you are an active contributor to the community, not just have been active maybe, I don't know, a few years ago and then you disappeared. I think they want to make sure that all the people with the current title of MVP, they are really active in their community. 
which makes sense probably. By being active in the community, you also have a newsletter, which is called Full Stack Bulletin. Mm -hmm. You submit uh, seven selected articles, one suggested book, and one tech code. Uh, the question is, is why would you resolve towards making a newsletter in the first place and what impact the newsletter have towards? A uh, good example, if let's say I have a newsletter, but I just use it for the sake of updates for the episode of the podcast, not mm -hmm. much I do it, but why would you resolve towards, let's say, submitting seven selected articles, one book and one quote based on what criteria? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And I don't know if I, it was really kind of a very conscious project, if I really had a very clear vision of what I wanted to achieve with this project. Because when I started, I was actually doing this with a, a very dear friend of mine as a side project. And the, the problem that we saw was uh, how do we keep ourselves up to date first with the world of like full stack development? There is so much happening every single week, new frameworks, new tools, uh, new languages even like how do we try to keep ourselves up to date and how do we uh, learn what's more important in all this noise and maybe we can focus more on these things so we what we were doing is basically we were collecting links every week in i don't even remember like one of these tools where you can take notes and collect links like delicious or one of those tools to just bookmark links and then we were like, okay, we bookmarked like hundreds of links in just a week. We didn't even have the time to read most of these things. So how do we know what's more important? And maybe we can spend a little bit more time next week actually learning about these things. So what we ended up doing was a very simple Lambda function that every week was uh, taking all these links. And I'm going to say there is a ranking algorithm, but it's the simplest thing you can ever imagine. It's literally just checking on Twitter and Facebook and all the social uh, platform, the number of shares for those links and basically giving the content score based on if more people share this content, maybe it's relevant for people, maybe it's more interesting. That, that was the whole ranking algorithm, nothing more uh, uh, fancy than that. So basically we ended up with a list that was somewhat sorted and then we decided, okay, this is actually something that makes sense. We are kind of figuring out a way to find seven interesting pieces of content every week. And seven seems like a manageable number that maybe you can read an article every day for the next week. So at that point we decide, okay, why don't we make a newsletter and make it available to other people because it can be useful also for other people and not just to us. And this is how full stack bulletin actually happened. And has never been like an overwhelming success. I think right now it's like, 2000 and something subscribers, which is not like a small number, but not even a huge number and has been growing organically for the last five years. I think like a few subscriber, new subscriber every week. So it's something that because it's so automated, it doesn't take a lot of effort to keep going every week. I think we spend something like between 15 minutes and 30 minutes every week where we just get the preview automatically generated from the Lambda and we just tweak it a little bit, make sure all the links are correct. We might fix pictures and descriptions, but at this point it's so low man maintenance that even if we don't necessarily get a lot of value out of it, uh, except being able to consume the links ourselves. Uh, and sometimes we, we got some sponsors, but they are barely covering the expenses. So yeah, I, I think, yeah, just because of that, we thought, okay, let's just keep it going because people are actually enjoying it and we are getting positive feedback. So why not continuing with that project? I like the part that you actually have a Lambda function for ranking posts. Yeah. So, so it's yeah. like, okay, this is my top post, but why don't, don't you like curate them? Like read the top seven articles and see, okay, if this fits or if it does mm -hmm. not fit. So maybe let's say the first five articles might talk about Node.js, two articles, let's say they talk about React, but maybe the eighth one and the ninth one is they talk about Node.js. So you might, you might fill them in and do, let's say, a special Node.js post with seven articles that about Node.js. And maybe next time you might fill the gap later on as, a, as an example. Yeah, that's no, a good question. I think we we are not spending a lot of time trying to make it super nice and you might probably figure out from every issue what are the things that we were mostly interested in the previous week 
because we literally keep bookmarking all the links that we bump into every week. And of course, those are links that are relevant to what we are doing at that moment in time. So there is definitely a bias that every issue is kind of, yeah, it's seven interesting links in the field of full stack web development for sure, but they are biased towards what we were interested in in the previous week. Like sometimes there are articles about Rust, for instance, which I wouldn't say is necessarily something that every full stack developer needs to learn, but it happened to be something that I was curious about and I was reading about and I found some interesting link and I just bookmarked it and then ended up being selected by this algorithm because other people in the world found it interesting and they share it as well. So it's uh, it's kind of a weird newsletter in that way. There is some curation, but it's uh, very lightweight. And the newsletter tends to be a little bit random in that sense. And then, of course, we try to make it look nice by giving it useful description, like, okay, you should read this article only if you're interested about this and you will learn X, Y, and Z. But at the same time, sometimes you might have a full newsletter that is almost entirely dedicated to React. Another time you might have a newsletter that talks about a new programming language, some Rust, some Go, some AWS. And as a full stack web developer, you might feel, okay, all this stuff might be interesting, but a little bit outside the comfort zone of, of a full stack web developer. So speaking of content, you're also a co-host on a podcast called AWS Bytes. Mm -hmm. you and your co-host talk about interesting topics related to AWS. Similar to the newsletter, what made you even uh, get into doing the podcast and how the process of choosing topics? I'm guessing like something either you're faced with or something of interest. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's usually, very... yeah with, I'm expecting also when people tweet out on you on specific topics as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but basically, this uh, initiative was born mostly by Owen Shanahi, who is the CTO of uh, Fortirem. And we were looking for some, let's say, lightweight way of creating content uh, to, I don't want to say advertise ourselves and the company, but just position ourselves a little bit more as experts of AWS or at least people interested in AWS and have an excuse to push more and more content out there. And when I, when I say simple, I think it's because we underestimated the amount of work that goes into creating a podcast and doing it every week. And I think you know that very well at this point. And uh, yeah, initially, we, we, if you look at the very first few episodes, it's like five minutes episodes. And we were literally trying to keep every episode in five minutes. So our idea was like small bites of AWS, and that's where the name comes from. And we were literally trying to answer one quick question every week. And then we realized that every week we were always going a little bit over the five minutes. Like I think the first one is around five minutes, then it starts to be six minutes, then seven minutes, then eight minutes, because we wanted to go a little bit deeper about every single piece of content. And we ended up rushing, but at the same time, overflowing the five minutes more and more. So eventually we removed the five minutes limitation and we said, okay, if we really want to explore this topic and do a good job, we're going to take 20 minutes, half an hour and try to cover it extensively. And also that was motivated by people sending us questions and saying, oh, I really like to understand more about IAM, for instance. Okay. How do you cover IAM in five minutes? I don't think it's possible. So we, we started to do episodes that most of the time tend to be a little bit more of a deep dive into a specific topic and not just a, a five minutes spill about like a quick question regarding AWS. We still do occasionally episodes that are shorter and they are a little bit simpler questions, but I, I think we are trying to go a little bit more deeper. One thing that I found is that on one side, we either cover things that we did at work or because we wrote an article that was relevant and it's easy to extrapolate an episode from that article, or we get questions from people and that's another topic, but sometimes we are also doing episodes where maybe we experimented with something new and it's something that we wanted to learn more. So we kind of push ourselves to do an episode just as an excuse to prepare all the material and deep dive and learn ourselves. So again, I think when with content creation, there is always an element of you learn something new and you want to share it. But at the same time, if you're pushing yourself to do that exercise, it's another excuse to learn more about that topic. So I think it's kind of a, 
virtuous cycle where just by trying to share something, you get a little bit more proficient with that particular thing. But I feel you on the podcast part. I started the podcast first by talking about topics that might interest me. Then I got two uh, AWS employees to do, and all of a sudden the podcast shifted from, let's say, half an hour, and then it became an hour and a half, <laughs> two hours, and then three hours and a half. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't even expect I'm going to sit three and a half hours talking about a specific topic or and not a specific topic. It's a series of small topics. Uh, mm -hmm. But but it's kind of those unexpected things where, let's say, I posted a post on Polywork and uh, they send it on the email newsletter. All of a sudden, I have 70 people now interested to be on the podcast. Nice. So, now, so I have a lot of curation to do now on Polywork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the thing that people discount about a podcast, and we did that as well, is all the work that goes into pre-production and post-production. I think the recording is the easiest part. And everyone thinks, oh yeah, recording is like one hour of work. No, no, but actually there is a lot more work before and a lot more work afterwards. And yeah, that, that's where you get lost and you end up spending a lot of time. Oh um, man, you don't... Don't ask me how many times in several podcasts I have to remove. Sometimes the speaker might have sneezed or oh, might yeah. have coughed and you have to, and it's like, let's say two hours and you have to cut this small part and you have to listen till you reach to that part. And then you have to wait for your laptop to, to completely render the video. It's pain. It's, yeah, it's, I, feel you on that. I feel you on that as well. I'm going to shift towards another question, which is uh, you launched serverless lab which is an in-house serverless training for teams. Uh, would mm -hmm. you like to talk more about this? What resolved you towards training and why did you choose to teach serverless? Yeah, absolutely. By the way, this is an initiative that is uh, uh, not really active right now, but if you look for the website, it's still there and you can read about it. And basically the, the story started um, I think it was 2000, between 2016 and 2017, if I remember correctly, but it was still very early days for serverless. I think Lambda, if I remember correctly, was launched in 2015. So it was still very, very early and you could literally do very simple things like, I don't know, building APIs with Lambda and API Gateway or building workers with Lambda uh, using SQS. And I remember at the time SQS didn't even have the event source buffer. So you really needed to create a schedule event and run your Lambda every minute and pull SQS if you wanted to use Lambda as a worker for SQS. So really was early days for, for Lambda and, and the whole serverless uh, movement. But what we did, I was working with a company that was building um, kind of an electricity project. Uh, it was like an electricity trading platform. Uh, and we decided to build everything using serverless, which was a little bit crazy in retrospective, but it was a great opportunity to, to learn, to start to learn serverless and start to see what you really have to do to put serverless in production for a non-trivial project. And at the end of that experience, uh, myself and another colleague at the time, we were doing a bunch of workshops in local uh, meetups or conferences trying to teach people what we learned doing serverless that way. And then we realized, okay, maybe there is a business opportunity here. Maybe we can actually create training programs and deliver it to companies that want to start embracing serverless. And this is again, where uh, your expectation and reality, there is a big gap there because we did all this work of actually creating the material, creating the branding, creating the website. And then we totally discounted the work in promotions and sales. So I think we, we managed to do only one training that we sold to a company. And after that, we didn't do anything anymore just because we still had our full-time job and we didn't, we were, we are not salespeople and we didn't want to spend time advertising and trying to sell to companies. So this is definitely one of the usual mistakes that engineers do that they might end up doing a lot of engineering work and they don't realize that to build a product, you still need to do a lot of marketing and sales. And either you find somebody that can help you with that, or you need to learn also all these things and invest your time doing all these kind of other activities. Well, why don't you resolve towards doing like recorded videos? So some people, let's say contributors, they create, let's say a mm -hmm. library and it catches some company's attention and they might ask for the 
contributor, the, the person who made the project or cohort the project to show them, let's say for their employees, uh, let's say a course. Uh, mm -hmm. let's say you've done about serverless, you publish a course about serverless and you promote it through the projects that you did. I think that could have been a very good idea in retrospective. I think at that point we just felt like, okay, we put a lot of effort into this. It's not really working. Let's leave the website up and running. If somebody finds it and they reach out to us, maybe we'll continue this project. We'll invest more into it. But we felt like, okay, we don't want to keep investing in this project if it's not giving us a, an immediate return. Again, I don't know if this was a good idea. Maybe at that point, once we had all that material, it wouldn't have costed us much more to try to do videos and try something else. It's just, I think that at that point, our interest faded and we wanted to do something else. And again, this was a side project. At the same time, we still had our full-time job. So. It's always one of those things that maybe if you get quick results, you are more incentivized to continue. Otherwise, you might just drop it and try something else. So uh, speaking of, let's say you have a full-time job and uh, doing side businesses as well and projects. Also, you've delivered 97 conferences, talks, and workshops. <laughs> that's a lot, man. That That's really a lot. Would you like to talk about some of them and what conferences or workshop influenced you or changed the pers your perspective the most? Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. And just to, just to be clear, I think that number is over five or six years. So if you just take an average, it's probably, I don't know, a little bit more of 10 engagements every year. And I, I, I try to count everything not just like conference talks, but even meetup talks, or even probably this podcast is going to go in the list as well. So in reality, if you're just thinking about conferences, the number is probably much smaller. This is just, just to be clear. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it's something that I really enjoy to do. I think I, I consider that pretty much together with uh, my activities in terms of content creation. I think participating to conferences and meetups and preparing talks and then engaging with people and listening to their talks or their questions about my talk. It's something that gives me a lot of value in the first place, because when you have to prepare a talk, again, it's almost like writing an article or writing a book where you literally are, you think you know something and then you start to put it down and you realize, actually, I don't think I know the answer to this question. Let me go and look it up and make sure I really understand before I put it into my slides and into my talk. So every time that I'm curious about something, I end up applying to a conference or a meetup saying, oh, I want to do a talk about this. And then if they accept me, and then I start to panic and say, oh, actually, now I need to really learn that stuff. I need to prepare the material. But then at the end of it, I come out of this process with a better understanding of a particular topic. When I deliver it, I get a lot of feedback and questions. And I try to do the exercise of reusing that talk for other conferences or other meetups or articles, whatever, because at that point, I think I got a lot of other questions and I understand a lot more how to shift that particular piece of content to be more valuable. So that's also another reason why you might see that big number in my list of activities, because I tend to recycle maybe the same talk or the same content for multiple occasions. So. Yeah, I don't know if this is answering the question because you also asked me what influenced me the most. Do you mean in terms of conferences that were more influential to my experience? Yeah, that's something like that. Yeah, that's that's an hard one to answer because uh, I think every conference it's uh, generally really cool and you get to learn a lot and meet a lot of people. So it, it's hard for me to actually find one in particular where... I would say, oh, this was the best conference ever. I learned so much. I think definitely trying to participate to more than one conference, it's interesting because you're going to end up meeting the same people again. And I think I built a network of people just by going to conferences and talking to other people. So probably the activity on its own is extremely valuable. And I would recommend people to, to try that, to just engage more with the communities and conferences and meetups are, are definitely a very good way to do that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of doing work with the community and meeting up with them, you've, you're one of the contributors and co-creators of MIDI. 
which is an AWS Lambda Node.js middleware. Actually, I was I was surprised that you actually are the co-creator. <laughs> like I didn't I didn't expect it, but uh, we used it actually at work and it oh, saved nice. us. It saved us a huge amount of work. I, I'm 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 gonna be very straight up with you. <laughs> Nice. That's the best feedback I can ask for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially when you, let's say you're using AGV and we need to validate lambdas and all of that. It, it was, it was, it was really good. I'm not going to lie, <laughs> but mm -hmm. what made you resolve to create MIDI in the first place? Yeah. So I, I was talking about that uh, electricity project and trying to figure out how to do serverless for, for the first time. That was the project where MIDI was born, not officially, but internally. Some, we created something like MIDI. And the reason why was because we were building a lot of lambdas for all sorts of like parts of the application. And we immediately realized, okay, we have this very clear pattern. Like this is the business logic. It's here at the center of our lambda, but then you have all the stuff before and after like validation, I don't know, input deserialization. And then afterwards we have, I don't know, error checking or output serialization. And every single Lambda was literally the same. There was a lot of noise before and after the code that actually mattered for that Lambda. So eventually we realized, okay, how do we solve this problem in other environments? For instance, if we were not using Lambda, how would we do this thing? And then we realized, okay, if we were using Express, you're probably going to use middlewares and try to uh, externalize all these concerns for every endpoint, you will probably have, I don't know, a validation middleware, a serialization and deserialization middleware, and you try to have this kind of reusable units that are very well defined, configurable, testable, and you just reuse them everywhere you need them. And then you focus only on the business logic in that particular endpoint. So we thought, can we bring the same idea into Lambda? And then we realized, yeah, there isn't anything like that out there, so we need to build it ourselves, but technically it's possible. And we built this kind of middleware engine that was extremely specialized for Lambda. So with the idea of you receive an event object, you produce a response object, very generic. It works even not just for APIs, for HTTP APIs, but even for, I don't know, S3 event notifications. You might you might have middlewares that do something with the S3 event and it can be useful also in that case. So basically, um, we refactor all our code with this idea of MIDI and we realize, okay, it works really well. And at that point is where we started to ask ourselves, can we open source this? Because if we have this problem and we didn't find a solution out there already, probably other people trying to use Lambda, they also have the same problem and they can start to use the same solution, contribute back and everyone is winning at that point. So we did open source MIDI and I think there was, yeah, the first version was zero point something that stayed there for like one year or more. And uh, at the same time, this was a little bit unfortunate. That project ended, like just after we open sourced it, we, our project was canceled. So we didn't have the use case in the first place anymore, but the community started to use it a lot. So I shifted to another job where I was not doing a lot of serverless at that point. But I was trying to keep up with the community and keep maintaining MIDI. And I did that for like about one year. But then eventually I was like, no, I, I have to give up because I'm, I'm kind of losing the perspective. I'm not building serverless projects anymore. People are asking all sorts of questions that I don't really fully understand because I'm not building stuff myself in the first place. And thankfully, somebody from the community, Will, uh, Will Farrell, who is now the main maintainer, stepped up and said, I'm okay, I can keep maintaining this project. I use it a lot. And he has been doing an amazing work since then. He basically, I published V1 and after V1, it started to take over and he contributed massively to publish V2 and V3 and he's already working on V4. So you've uh, contributed to several open source projects, which MIDI is one of them. Uh, for someone mm -hmm. who never contributed towards open source, would you like to provide tips on starting towards open source? Yeah, I think it's uh, probably easier than most people would expect. And I think the easiest thing that you can do to start with open source is in your day to day, you are probably building a lot of stuff and you don't even realize how useful some of this stuff can be. 
to other people. So sometimes the easiest way to start with open source is just, okay, if you have built a utility that is generic enough that you think other people might find useful, just try to put it in a repository, just try to write a few tests, just try to write a good readme and some documentation, just publish it out there, and then maybe share it in places where you think that particular tool might be relevant, I don't know, uh, groups with your colleagues, or I don't know, Facebook groups, uh, uh, depending whatever is the tool, you're probably going to find different communities that might be interested into it and try to receive feedback and see if somebody wants to help you out with that project. This is one way where you are kind of the author of the project. And that's one way to work in open source. Another way might be kind of the opposite. You're probably using a lot of tools in your day-to-day -day work that are open source. And you are probably wondering, oh, I wish that there was this feature, or I wish that there was that, or maybe there is this bug that is very annoying. Most of the time, as a developer, you have the power of actually making that happen, whether it's fixing a bug or proposing a new feature. If the project is open source, chances are that you can just go on GitHub or wh wherever the, the project is hosted and co try to contribute to the project, speak, present a case, present some code changes, and be involved in the community. And I definitely recommend doing both of these activities or at least one of these activities because in both cases, you are just going to learn a lot and become a better software engineer just by virtue of interacting with other people, getting feedback, getting your implementation challenged as well, or I don't know, just having the conversation, trying to figure out how do we make this happen in the best possible way, not just for my own use case, but for everyone else use cases. I'm going to shift towards a different question. And it's a, more of a general question, which is what type, what tips do you have for anyone starting in the software development world based on your experience? And should this person start with utilizing the cloud first or build the basics and then shift towards cloud? That's a very good question. I don't really know if I have a clear answer, to be honest with you. I think, uh, um, the way I will describe software engineering is more of a journey rather than a destination. You are constantly moving forward, but the destination is never really clear. And every time you learn something new and you decide, okay, where do you want to go next? But yeah, that, that plan is always changing because it's a, it's a system that is changing so frequently and so fast that you are just trying to keep up and, and you try to guess even sometimes what's going to be the next big thing and try to learn it or you just keep going based on what you find in your day-to-day -day experience. So it's very hard to tell somebody in advance, I don't know, if you want to build a career, study this thing, and then in three years, you're going to be an expert, you're going to make a lot of money, you're going to build a successful career. I think, I don't know if that works, if anyone could do that. Of course, there are things that are basics that everyone needs to know, and probably it's a good place to start if you are literally starting from scratch learning the basics is something that is definitely going to be useful anyway. And that's why doing something like, I don't know, either university or boot camps or places where you spend a little bit of time learning all the theory and all the basics about IT in general can be really useful. But at the same time, I always find when people do that experience, and I did it myself, that you are very detached from reality. It's like, oh, I'm learning everything about databases but I don't even know how to use a database. Like I know how a database works internally, but how do I do a query? How, how do I build an application that uses a database? Like sometimes this kind of uh, training material like universities and so on can be very detached from reality. So what I like to suggest people is try to do a little bit of both, like try to learn the theory and the principles, but at the same time, try to build something small yourself. It doesn't have to be I don't know, the next million dollar startup or billion dollar startup, even if it's a to-do application, chances are that just by trying to build that to-do application with a database and an API or whatever, you are going to fill the gap between theory and practice. And then at the end of the day, you start to build a kind of mental framework of, you know how it works, but also you know how to make it up and what do you need to do to actually build something based on that theoretical knowledge. I don't know if this answers the question because yeah, I still yeah, find it very hard to recommend people what is the path to take. It's it's quite of a difficult thing because uh, each person it, it's it's more like a biased 
suggestion. Mm-hmm. So you might suggest something, I might suggest something. Uh, but usually, let's say, for example, on my path, uh, at first, it was so weird. I actually didn't start software development as software development, like writing websites. I started game development. Oh, that's super cool. I started game development. I went to like game jams. I entered competitions. Uh, uh, it was fun, but then I just realized, okay, it's fun, but it's not something I'm going to do on a day-to-day basis. So I shifted mm-hmm. towards software development, doing websites, doing mobile apps. And I felt, okay, this feels a little bit much more better, but I've tried to do certain things to see if this fits me or this not fits me. Because usually, let's say when you first start out and someone told me, okay, start game development. I've tried it. Uh, I liked it, but I wouldn't see myself in it. But mm. nobody came up and told me, okay, how about if you wrote websites? I, nobody told me that. I tried, I shifted myself on my own and I felt, okay, this is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So the kind of recommendation some people give is a little bit biased at a certain level, but it's always good because you're reaching somewhere. So if you tried it and it didn't fit you, at least you've tried something. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the privilege that we have in this industry is that everything you want to try is literally just a click away or a few keyboard taps away because you just need to install something, try something and you can make things happen. And I didn't realize that that's a privilege until I started to talk with other kind of engineers, like, I don't know, mechanical engineers or, I don't know, biochemical engineers, whatever, where they need to have a lab to try anything. They need to get parts and they need to wait months just to try to have a prototype. And that can be, I think the growth there is very different and people need to be a lot more clear on what they want to achieve than we do because for us it's so easy to just delete everything, create another file, start again, try another thing. And I think that that's the beauty of our industry where we can really create whatever we want from scratch and it doesn't take too long to try different things. And actually it's very cheap as well. Like you don't have to invest in buying things or building a lab. Also, that's a, that's a fair point. <laughs> I'm going to shift towards uh, another question, which is that you have a YouTube channel where you have a guest and you would work on, let's say, advent of code and Rust. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk more about this? And and what about Rust specifically? Just curious. Like, I have some curiosity towards learning Rust, Mm -hmm. but I just hadn't found, let's say, the ultimate reason of why I should use Rust. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh... Actually, I'm going to start from the second question first, because I think that kind of motivates the why do we have a YouTube channel and so on. So I, I'm, I think at this point of the interview, I think people got uh, the idea that I, I tend to be a very curious person. I like to try different things and then learn from all these kind of experiments. And of course, Rust is a little bit of a hype in the technology field at this point. So I got curious about Rust as well. And I I think the main thing that I found interesting myself and then I decided to invest more time in Rust is because I realized that for basically 99% of my career, I have been working with high-level programming languages like PHP, uh, JavaScript, a little bit of Java, which people would argue is kind of a lower-level language, but it's still, to me, a high-level language. You have garbage collector, you have a bunch of stuff that is like high-level. So I started to, when I saw Rust, I was like, oh, this seems like a nice way to start to see what happens with lower level programming language, where you need to think about memory, you need to think about the difference between the heap and the stack, and you need to be careful of what you do. And But by doing that, you might also end up with building software that is highly optimized for a particular task. So for me, that was the main motivation to explore Rust. And of course, I could have done that with C and C++, but... I know based on what people say that C and C++ take literally decades before you can call yourself not even an expert, but somebody that is proficient with the language and that can build something that is actually stable. So I always been quite discouraged to go with C and C++ with Rust because the community did such a great job with the compiler. It's kind of a weird experience. It's like you are constantly getting the compiler yelling at you like, why are you doing this? You should be doing this other way. And I'm not going to compile until you fix it. 
which can be a little bit frustrating at the beginning, but at the same time, I think it speeds up a lot that learning curve when you really understand all the principles. And this is kind of the killer feature of Rust that tries to give you a language that by the semantic of the language eventually allows you to compile only programs that are built in a kind of memory safe way. So it's literally guiding you to understand what are the principles that guarantees you that your software is going to run without memory problems. So it's really interesting to learn Rust just to go through that experience of coming from an high level language, you understand how memory works, and then the compiler is guiding you to actually write code that uses memory in the best possible way. So that, that was the reason why uh, the whole interest in Rust. And then I was actually uh, talking about that with a few friends of mine, also software engineer, uh, engineers, and we decided to start this uh, Twitch channel where we, we said, okay, we want to learn Rust. We need to find a way for us to commit to learning Rust consistently. And this looks like a great way. Like we commit ourselves to do a stream every week for just one hour. And what can we do? Maybe solve advent of code, which seems like not the easiest thing you could do, but it's a constant source of challenges to do. And basically we just stream our attempts to solve exercises in Rust. And it's funny because most of the time people watching us, they know more than we do about Rust. So they are giving us a lot of suggestions on how to improve the solution or write better Rust code. So it's again, an excuse for us to learn faster and learn from other people. While at the same time, we are creating material that other people in the future can look at and maybe learn something as well. That's actually cool. I didn't expect, uh, it's like, I've kind of realized, like, if you want to do something, you just create something to motivate you to do something. Exactly. <laughs> This is pretty much my style. And most of the time I regret that decision because then it becomes a commitment and it becomes pressure. But if I look at all these things in retrospective, I think they've been extremely valuable for me to, to learn more and engage with more people and get feedback. And again, it's that whole virtuous cycle of the more you put yourself out there and you share something, the more you kind of raise your chances of somebody coming in and telling you, did you consider doing it this other way? Or by the way, if you do it this other way, you are going to get, I don't know, this other benefit. And maybe something that I wouldn't ever know if I didn't just push myself to, to share it with other people. So I always end the podcast with a mental health question. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you ever faced burnout or imposter syndrome? Actually, uh, you did face burnout when you did spam. So <laughs> this kind of the question asked itself on its own. Uh, but if you did, uh, what did you resolve towards the, solving these issues? Yeah, I think in in our our industry industry is very common to to burn out. And uh, again, th this is probably the other side effect of what I just said before that you can do so many things in such a short amount of time, and you can build so many amazing things just with a click or a few taps on the keyboard. And you just need literally, you don't need to invest a single cent. You just need to spend your time, learn something, and you are capable of building something new from, from scratch. I think that created also expectations on the other side that you need to be able to do a huge amount of things to consider yourself a professional. And that's sometimes it's a little bit unfair because I see that even if you just open a job advertisement, that even a junior level job has, I don't know, 20 technologies that you need to know to just be considered, which is, we know is not realistic, but I think that's the expectation in the market that, oh, as an engineer, you need to know everything and you need to be able to do everything. And, and I think that sometimes creates a kind of imposter syndrome and it creates that burnout where you are struggling to kind of learn more and more and you're trying to prove yourself that you can do anything. And there is a lot of pressure to, to try to deal with all these things. So I think, first of all, you need to accept that you, you, you're not going to be able to know everything, never, like not even if you have 40 years of experience in the industry, because again, the industry is always moving. There are always new things and there are more things every day that you can possibly learn in one day. So you're never going to keep up with the industry. So I think what at least what I try to tell myself to, to cope with this imposter syndrome and risk of burning out 
just by chasing all sorts of different things is that it's okay not to know everything as long as you are comfortable telling other people, I don't know this thing, but if you want, I can invest my own time researching it and experimenting. And eventually I will probably be able to do something useful with what you are requesting me to do. And that I think it on one side, it's a shift that everyone needs to do. On the other side, we also need to start educating the market that it's okay not to know everything and that people will be smart enough to do their own research, reach out to other people, look at the communities, look at Stack Overflow, whatever, and eventually come up with solutions for the particular problem. Uh, I think, yeah, that mindset of everyone needs to be an expert on everything is, is something we need to eradicate from, from the, the market in general. I don't know if I'm answering the question, by the way. No, it's actually part of the question is that the expectations of, let's say, the imposter syndrome, where you enter in a market, you think that you're not doing enough because the expectations of, I need to be fitting this criteria, or you mm -hmm. might be with a team that have years of experience and you feel that you're, you don't feel that you belong being with them, even though mm -hmm. you might have the good amount of skills. So you might start doubting yourself that, oh, maybe if I, I, I'm not that much of a competent developer, how am I reach to them? I even face this a lot, actually. So it's, it's something that's normal. It's, it's not, it, it's much more seen in the tech world because it's something that all of us share. Mm -hmm. So it, it's much more visible in other places. It might not be that much visible, but to us, I don't know why in the tech world, it's, it's very, very visible of the whole imposter syndrome. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, again, it's because of, there is this massive expectation that even to just land a basic job, you need to know so many things and you need to prove you are an expert on so many things, which is never going to be the case. Maybe you are an expert in one thing and you barely know the other 20 things, but I think that's absolutely fine. You can definitely, I mean, if you have the basics, and if you have a little bit of experience, you can definitely research whatever you need to know on the job about the other 20 technologies that you don't know yet and learn on the job and do a good job anyway. Another thing that I would like to encourage people to do more, and it might have a little bit of uh, reflection on this question, is try to share everything you learn. Because I think at that point, even simple things, like sometimes you don't realize the value that's something you share, even if it's simple, can have on other people that maybe are a little bit earlier in the journey than you are. So at that point, if you do that and you start to get feedback and engage more with people, again, it's going to uh, uh, make you realize even more how everyone is in this journey where everyone is trying to learn different things and everyone is trying to come up with solutions to different problems. And everyone has a little bit of mixed experience based on their path and other people will come up with other experiences. And eventually, I think that the dream is where you find teams where everyone works well together and people are able to help each other with their own different experiences and build based on their strengths and compensate their own weaknesses. 